The Samnites are not as famous as, say, the Gauls or the Etruscans, but they were just as great and important of an enemy that the Roman Republic had to conquer before they could turn their gaze outside of Italy. The Samnites are most famous for the three wars fought between themselves and their allies against the newly ascendant Roman Republic in the 3rd and 4th centuries BCE. However, the history of the Samnites is not bound to three wars. They were a proud people, with roots dating back to one of the most important culture groups in Roman history, the Sabines. So join me today as we take a look at the history of the Samnites before their famous wars with Rome and unravel just how the two groups would eventually fight a series of wars that set the Roman Republic on the path of Italian and Mediterranean dominance. The Samnites inhabited a portion of Italy called Samnium. I doubt I need to tell you just who the region was named after. They were an Italic people who spoke an Italic language called Ossian. Ossian is a particularly fascinating language inside of the Italic language group, as not only does it include words and other holdovers from the ancient languages of Proto-Italic peoples, but by the time of the Samnites it had borrowed and adapted the Etruscan alphabet. If you've watched my Etruscan videos, which I would certainly recommend you check out after this one, then you would know that the Etruscan language is seemingly a pre-Indo-European language. This would mean then that Ossian, more than any other Italic language, was a combination language with a spoken base in Indo-European language and a written base in Proto-Indo-European alphabets. The Samnites themselves first come into the historical record in the 5th century BCE. However, most historians, and at least some findings in the archaeological record, indicate that the Samnites were likely inhabiting the region of Samnium much earlier than that. The Samnites seemed to have originated from an older Italic people, while ancient Greek historians and authors were seemingly convinced that these older Italic peoples were the Umbri, a group in central Italy, most modern historians as well as the Romans, and even some classical Greek authors, believe that the Samnites originated from the Sabine peoples. The very same Sabine peoples that were made so famous during the horrific rape of the Sabine women and their subsequent absorption and integration into the Roman Kingdom. The Sabines are said to have settled in central Italy around the 10th century BCE, where they lived as a separate Italic people until their aforementioned integration into the Roman Kingdom during the reign of Romulus, roughly 753 to 716 BCE. A small portion of the Sabines did live separately from Rome for a time following this, but they were also integrated during the early Roman Republic, a topic that will get its own video one day. Following this integration, it would only take a few centuries for history to begin to refer to the Sabines as Roman, and with that, the integration was truly complete. So then where in the story did the Samnites split off? Well, frankly, it's a little hard to tell. We're fairly sure it happened before the rape of the Sabine women, so likely before 753 BCE at least. In truth, it may very well have been decades, or even centuries before, we just don't know for sure. However, what we do think we know is just what actions occurred that led to this split. To discuss these actions, we are first going to have to discuss a very important religious practice of the Italic peoples, the Ver Sacrum. The Ver Sacrum is something often overlooked in the study of the Italic peoples, mostly because Rome had a similar version of the practice that seems to have overridden the Ver Sacrum in Roman culture, called the Devito. In fact, we only have one concrete mention of the Ver Sacrum in Roman history, and that is during the Second Punic War following the Great Defeat at Cannae, and this concerned only the livestock of the city. But for groups like the Samnites, this practice was of vital importance. The Ver Sacrum is typically performed in times of great crisis, say a famine, or when badly losing a war. The Ver Sacrum involved an oath, or a vow, from some grouping of people. That could be a singular city, multiple cities, or, in this case, seemingly the entirety of the population. This vow was typically given to Mars, but could be given to any deity. In this vow, the group in question swore to sacrifice every living thing born in the next spring. For the Samnites, this would have been from the 1st of March to the last day of April, to the god in question. And when I say every living thing, I mean every living thing. From domestic animals, to pets, to children. Yeah, children. In the early history of the Italic peoples, we are fairly positive that this sacrifice truly meant sacrifice, and every child born would be ritualistically sacrificed to the god in question. However, by the time that the Samnites were splitting from the Sabines, this sacrifice came to mean a different thing entirely for the human children involved. While the animals would still be sacrificed, the children would be spared. They would grow up just as every other child of whatever group in question did. They would be taught the same thing, and eat the same foods, and so on. 
However, upon the spring in which they turned 20 or 21, depending on who took the vow, the group of now adults would be blindfolded, led to a portion of the border of their people, and were told to follow some sort of animal until they found the area whereby the god from the original vow wished for them to settle. These groups of adults were called the Sankrani, and were believed to be both divinely protected and guided during their journey to their new home. This was not an isolated practice. We know of several verse sacrums throughout Italian history. The Herpini, Pictines, the Mamertines, and even the famous Acqui were all said to be founded through a verse sacrum. Typically, these groups would take the name of whatever animal was said to be their guide. The Herpini are named because their guide was a wolf, or Herpoius in Latin. The Pictines were named for the woodpecker, Picus in Latin. The Mamertines seemingly received their name directly from Mars himself, and the Aqui are named for the horse, Equus in Latin. The Samnites were said to be guided by an ox, or a boss in Latin. Yeah, it doesn't match up, but the Samnites did at least name their capital Bonavinium, so at least they tried. It seems like the word Samnite comes from the same root as the word Sabine in Latin, and this is probably even more evidence that the two groups were related in some way. Anyway, this ox was sacrificed on the hill upon which Bovinium was founded. We believe this series of events occurred sometime in the 7th century BCE. However, once again, that date could be off by a few hundred years either way. The Samnites were split into a further four tribes. These four tribes were the Herpini, the Caudini, the Kerasini, and the Pintri. And yes, that is the same Herpini from just a moment ago. Again, we aren't too sure why, but the Herpini claimed to have been guided by a wolf to their settlement. We're not quite sure what to make of this seeming contradiction. Did the Herpini simply claim such to attempt to set themselves apart from the other Samnites? Were they a separate verse sacrum altogether and were just eventually absorbed into the Samnite fold? Or were they a part of the same verse sacrum, but simply led from or let go at a different point? We aren't quite sure, and we may very well never know. But we do know that the Herpini, along with the other three groups, made up what was known as the Samnite Confederation, or the Samnite League. Now this should not be considered a real political entity. Instead, this confederation or league was more of a ceremonial and loose grouping of what were essentially four independent political entities. These groups answered to no central government, and operated typically at the tribal or city level. At first, shortly after their settlement, the Samnites were ruled over by individual chieftains, and were almost totally nomadic and pastoral, with small settlements that served religious and some governmental purposes. However, likely by the 5th century BCE, but certainly by the 4th century BCE, a rising population and more and more contact with the trade networks of Italy led to the development of a more agrarian and settled way of life. These rural settlements, called Vicii, were ruled over by, and possibly elected, magistrates. These Vicii were at the bottom of the Samnite social hierarchy, along with the remaining nomadic groups. These rural settlements were then grouped into small cantons, called Pagi, or Pagus, which were governed by an elected official, called a Medicis. Finally, these Pagus answered to the Tutos, which were the Samnite tribes mentioned previously. These tribes were then governed by the Medis Tuktvis, who was an elected official with supreme executive and judicial powers. Some of these cities may have even had their own senate, or rather elected assemblies. We know of one such example in Pompeii, yes, that Pompeii, called the Combienio, which functioned similarly to the Roman senate. However, just as with Rome, this did not mean that the average person suddenly held all the power in Samnite society. Instead, Samnite society was still dominated by aristocratic families, several of which would actually go on to be influential in Roman history. The rise in population that motivated the creation of a more settled and organized Samnite state likely also motivated the Samnites to expand beyond their homeland of Samnium. The Etruscans, which at this point held quite a bit of land throughout Italy, abandoned Campania in the 5th century BCE. The Samnites took this opportunity to move in, establish colonies, and conquer the cities which were already established. This is when the famous Pompeii fell under the control of the Samnites. We have next to no detailed records of these wars. In fact, we don't even really know for sure why the Samnites decided to swoop in and take control. We know, of course, that the population was rising, so we assume that it was likely because of the simple fact that Campania was a fertile region with quite a bit of good land to grow crops in, but we aren't really sure. This theory would seem to indicate that Samnium was not fertile enough for the Samnites, which is contradicted by the fact that the Samnites had a massively successful agricultural economy, with enough product left over to supply other italic groups. 
So maybe the Samnites wanted other resources, or maybe they simply wanted to expand because they could. In any case, this was not the last of Samnite expansion. At roughly the same time, Greek influence in Italy began to wane. This presented a golden opportunity for the Samnites. The Greek cities of Italy were rich, well-built, and prestigious, and so the Samnites did not pass the opportunity up. In the ensuing wars, the Samnites took cities like Cumae, and apparently attempted to take Naples, considered by some to be the unnamed capital of Magna Graecia, but ultimately failed to take the city. While our records are almost non-existent, we are fairly positive that the Samnites warred with the Etruscans, Greek, and even Latins in the centuries after these events, but before the wars with Rome, and likely conquered and lost towns in equal measure. While we have covered most of what we know of Samnite history up to the Samnite wars with Rome, I would be remiss if I didn't at least touch on the Samnite military. Roman historians, Livy included, treated the Samnites like they were Italy's version of the Spartans. They were particularly terrified of the Samnite cavalry. This reputation led to the Samnite military being called the Belliger Samnis, or Warrior Samnites. A sort of honorific to show just how impressive the Samnite military was to their Roman counterparts. But is there any truth to these accounts? Or is this just another attempt by the Romans to make their history all the more incredible? Well, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. The Samnite army was certainly impressive. From the earlier portions of Samnite history, the core of the military was made up of a group of men trained by their local leader. This group, similar to the Romans, relied upon their own personal wealth to purchase their arms and armor. Because of this, the more wealthy Samnites typically had the best gear and were the elite troops of the army. The Samnites likely trained their troops in a central triangular form in much the same way that Rome did. By the time of the Roman Samnite Wars, the Samnites had adopted a mostly Greek style of fighting. However, due to their mountainous homeland, the Samnite army actually consisted of companies adept at nearly every style of fighting popular at the time. From phalanxes to hoplites to an early version of the maniple system and cohorts made of 400 men, the Samnites focused heavily on being adapted warriors, able to shift between styles as needed to conform with the terrain and other obstacles. The gear of these troops ranged from breastplates barely large enough to cover their chest, worn by the poorer troops of course, all the way up to full hoplite armor, based around what the Greeks of the time wore. In fact, Samnite gear seems to be almost carbon copies, or at least heavily inspired by, Greek military equipment. So then we come back to our original question. Is the reputation of the Samnite army given by Roman historians fair and or accurate? Well, the Samnite army was certainly impressive, and a worthy match to face off against the Roman military. They were flexible, well equipped, and bolstered by a recruitment drive near the time of war with Rome. However, given the tendency of Roman historians and authors to, shall we say, embellish the power, majesty, and military might of their enemies, we should take much of these accounts with a bit of skepticism. The truth likely lies somewhere in the middle. So were the Samnites the Spartans of Italy? Probably not. Were they a worthy match to face off against Rome? Certainly. The Samnites were one of the last Italic enemies of Rome. They were a proud people with a lineage just as old and just as impressive as that of Rome itself. They were the last descendants of the Sabines, a people Rome had already assimilated centuries ago. The Samnites were, in many ways, the last Italic peoples that Rome would have to conquer. Their three wars would be the last time that we can truly call Rome an Italian power. Following those wars, Rome was a newly crowned Mediterranean power. But what happened in those wars? How did Rome come out on top? And why did these wars elevate Rome to the status of Mediterranean power? Join me next time as we attempt to answer those questions and more. Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you learned something. I wanted to give you all some background on the Samnites before we start to talk about the wars themselves. I really think that a lot of history during this period gets skipped and boiled down into wars with Rome and hopefully I have helped to bring some history forward that might have been missed otherwise. If you have any comments or questions on the video or believe I've made a mistake, please comment down below and please like and subscribe if you enjoyed, it really helps the channel out. Peace!